going to do something a little bit different. To the outside world, there are a number of misconceptions about high technology, about Silicon Valley, that may color or stand in the way of your taking on a new venture or starting a new business. So what I'd like to do in just a few minutes that I have is bust the myth, bust five myths about the high technology marketing, high technology communications. So I'm going to be in this closing session, my closing <coughs> session, the myth buster. It's going to open the floodgates for you all to move into the market and start a new company. The first myth is what I call the best technology always wins myth. This is categorically wrong. The best technology, the best services, the best products do not always win. Sometimes very bad technology takes root in the world and becomes the dominant player. Um, Windows 95 was the equivalent <laughs> of Macintosh 1989. It was not better technology, but it became ubiquitous. Um, the, you're probably way too young to remember the VHS Betamax is a classic example of the best technology, um, clearly not winning. But more importantly than the technology, and more importantly than the, more important than the product, t today, what matters more than the technology, which is important, and I'm realizing I'm talking to a number of computer scientists and engineers and computer science professors. What's more, more important is the extent to which a service that rides on top of the technology architecture is a network effect business. A network effect is what you get when you have three, uh, so one fax machine or one smartphone is absolutely useless. Two smartphones, you suddenly have value, the value of each one of those increases. So Bob Metcalf, who's the inventor of Ethernet, has a Metcalf's law, which says the value of a network is equal to the number of people, number of nodes on that network squared. Right? So if you have four nodes on a network, it's like four squids, four squared. <laughs> Not much of a numbers person, communications guy. Yeah, you can tell. Uh, so, um, a network a network effect takes hold when you can when you can t introduce a service to the world where you get increased numbers of users and exponentially a greater benefit. A uh, classic example of a networks based business is uh, Facebook or Twitter or Zynga or LinkedIn. Right. So you take Twitter where I was an early advisor, and they now have over 100 million users, that's probably a low number, but you, multi you square that, and you get the value of that network. And in turn, you can kind of extrapolate for the valuation, right? <laughs> because they're gonna rib me later on, I'm sure. <laughs> That'll be fun. He's gonna so, tell us actually what it is. That's, that's <laughs> the really interesting part. So the communications lesson about this idea that the best technology um, uh, does not always win, is that if you can demonstrate to the world that you have a product or service that will become a network effect, venture capitalists will beat a path to your door. So that's, I, I busted myth number one, all right? Myth number two, he who has the first mover advantage wins all the marbles, right? He's the ruler of the day, the person who has the first mover advantage. This is categorically untrue. Um, obviously, there are examples of companies like Amazon or eBay who did establish a first mover advantage in their category. And then, of course, they developed businesses that were wildly and continue to be wildly, wildly successful. But I think back to my experience at Google. When I started at Google in 2001, in the winter of that year, there were 12 search engines on the market. And Google was a tiny player. Yahoo was the big bazooka of search. The big, the big player. There was AltaVista, there was Magellan, there was Netscape Communicator, the uh, Navigator, or whatever, Netscape Magellan, all these guys were out there. Uh, Ask Jeeves, was that there? So there were lots of search engines. That didn't stop Larry and Sergey. They had a better idea, right? I remember doing press calls when I was director of communications at Google in 2001, and pick up the phone and I'd call a reporter, and I'd say, yeah, I'm calling from Google. Who? What's who's Google? 
Oh, we're a search, we're a search engine. Oh, kind of like Alta Vista. Yeah, yeah, kind of like Alta Vista. And then, and then they think we are a nonprofit. It was crazy. It was crazy. <laughs> Convince the world that you have a solution that's faster, cheaper, better, and that's going to help people's lives. And you'll overcome this whole first mover advantage myth. Myth number two is now, thanks to me, busted forever. <laughs> All right, myth number three. The consumer always knows best. Well, sometimes that's right, but not in Silicon Valley. And really, if, or not in most commercial markets. If Henry Ford had asked his customers what he wanted, they would have said, a faster horse, please, <laughs> right? Okay, if uh, Steve Jobs had asked the pre-Macintosh community what they wanted, they would say, we want a better dumb terminal, <laughs> right? They wouldn't have said a mouse. We want graphical user interface. We want pull-down menus. They wouldn't have thought of any of that. Right? His customers never would have said, we want an iPhone, right? So listen to your customers, but only so closely. You've got to explode their vision of what life can be like, right? Steve Jobs and what the Apple folks did and what we did when I worked there in the late 80s and early 90s, we weren't building product. We weren't building power books. We were expressing the Apple vision and each product that came out of the manufacturing facility was just another expression of that same vision, right? To the extent that Coco Chanel sells smelly water, <laughs> right? Right? What's, what she's selling, what Hermes is selling, is a new approach to modern living, right? That's what Steve Jobs and Apple were all about, right? Customers knows best, but the innovators, the folks in this room, the people who are building the next generation of companies, they know better. Think about Twitter. What a, I mean, who on earth would ever need this messaging system where you write 140 characters and you post it to all these people? Who cares what you ate for lunch, right? Well, apparently, over 100 million people care. And by the way, it's um, kind of important in geopolitics now. And it's a medium that is of consequence. So, communication lesson number three here, busting the myth of the consumer no, customer knows best. Let the product, if it's powerful, let it speak for itself. Let the dogs eat the dog food, right? You know that expression, right? Give the product to the world. If people will buy it, if people are going to use it, and it takes, and it gets traction, right? Everything else will look after itself. It's a little bit counterintuitive. Myth number four, this is the penultimate myth of the five. The smartest people and the brightest talent are all in Silicon Valley. <laughs> Arrogant Silicon Valley, pompous Silicon Valley. We're perpetuating this myth all the time. And I'm here to declare with my friends and colleagues that it's wrong. There's great talent all over the place. If you just look at, just look at um, other regions of, of, of North America, in Seattle you've got Microsoft, Amazon, boatloads of companies, and they're even calling it Silicon Forest. <laughs> right? Okay. You go to New York City, you've got Foursquare, Tumblr, and thanks you guys for the help of Kickstarter. All these amazing, and they're calling it Silicon Alley. <laughs> <laughs> really cool, right? I understand they're doing something in Iowa, and they're calling it Silicorn Valley. <laughs> so, so clearly the idea of Silicon Valley is something that people like. Internationally, in Scotland, they have Silicon Glen. Isn't that beautiful? And in London now, they have Silicon Roundabout. <laughs> I think Portugal should be Silicon Fado. Uh, but seriously, the great ideas are everywhere, and people are innovating all over the planet. We don't have a monopoly on innovation, and that is a big myth that you should be busting with me today with the stuff that you're going to work on in the future. Finally, this is, this is one that I'm passionate about, and, and it's um, a little more involved. And it's the myth that perception is reality. Sometimes it's true, but from my experience in 25 years at, at Apple and Sun and Novell and Google and Twitter and all these amazing companies, is the challenges of managing perceptions. 
with the facts to back you up. And this all goes down to, this all comes down to this notion of storytelling, which I explored in depth yesterday. I don't have time to do it today. But if you can manage the story, then you can manage the perception. But you've got to have the fact to support you. So I'm going to take just a minute and go to my improvised whiteboard that the team was kind enough to set up. This is high technology. <laughs> this is, this is um, um, uh, something that uh, I believe is worth the price of admission for your being here today. <laughs> so you can take this with you and you'll use it in your future. There are only four stories. This has to do with uh, market perceptions. There are only four stories that the press corps like to cover. Think of a clock. A clock. 12 o'clock is at the top. 3 o'clock, 6 o'clock, 9 o'clock. <coughs> Can everybody see that? Just a clock. Just like you can, if you can't see it, look at your wristwatch. <laughs> There's four quadrants on this clock. There's only four stories that the press like to cover. Story number one is what's called, I call top of the hill. These are great stories about companies like Apple and Facebook, Groupon, <laughs> Twitter, untouchable, invincible, consecutive quarters of profitability and growth. The press loves to write this story. Give it to them, but measure it out. Be sure you know what you're doing. Story number two, perched for a fall. <coughs> um, well, I call this also the 3.30, the 3.30 story. You've got, if you're a PR director at a big company and you see some bad news on the, on the horizon, you've got to brace yourselves for a 3.30 story where the press is going to say, hey, they missed a quarter. Hey, partners are bailing. Hey, this is not going to be a profitable you know, enterprise. Right? And they'll, they'll write the story. I don't know um, who I would put in the 330 story. Nokia, perhaps? Yeah. A little bit beleaguer. Rim. Rim, great example. Any Rim. others? Groupon, interesting. Okay. Interesting. Which one? Portugal. Yeah. Ah, no, that's not fair. Okay. Water <laughs> number three. This is the dumpster story. You want to avoid this story, but if you land in the dumpster, you want to motor through this quadrant as quickly as you can. Companies in the dumpster today, sadly, AOL, uh, Yahoo to a certain degree. Um, but, but I put Yahoo much more in the fourth quadrant, which I call the turnaround. Right? What's interesting about the turnaround story is the communications director, once a quarter, when, Wall, when they do the Wall Street analyst call, is in control of the message. They get one chance to develop a sound bite that's going to, that's going to forecast what the company's going to be like when they become a top of the hill story. This goes back to what I'm saying about being prepared to manage your story, but only with the facts in hand. So many companies get into trouble by pushing a story well ahead of its facts, right? Which is what a good PR person should do, but they should be confident that the facts will ultimately come up and support the story. The Google experience for me was the exact opposite. The facts were way ahead of the story. In the, you know, the 2002, 2003, 2004, the pre-IPO time frame. And so we had, to, we had to kind of condition the market and get them ready for, you know, what the reality was going to be about the business, which was extraordinary and continues to be that way. So a couple of quick observations, and then I can't wait for the discussion, um, about this, this. This is called Raymond's Clock, by the way. <laughs> Trademark. <laughs> <laughs> is you can't turn back time, right? Remember when Steve Jobs mispriced the first iPhone in 2007? He took the hit, motored through came top of the hill, right? You didn't try to turn back time. You just can't do that. The other observation is a global phenomenon. You can be a top of the hill story in Paris, but in the dumpster in Sydney, Australia. And the most important thing, and it's relevant today to um, the services that we use like um, Twitter and, and, and Facebook and LinkedIn, it's time compression makes these press cycles go faster and faster and faster. And if a company is incapable of managing that kind of change or that velocity, it cripples their ability to deal with, deal with change. 
So this is my perception meter. It also applies to political candidates. <laughs> Fun with that. Um, anyhow, uh, I hope that I've given you confidence about the, uh, the world of Silicon Valleys and inspired you to make a Silicon Valley here in Lisboa. Okay. Thank you. Uh, context dependent, right? Sometimes, sometimes you can have very meaningful conversations with customers about what they want and you know about innovation. Uh, often you see that on the enterprise side, people go, if you build, you know, this big fucking machine that does this, this, and this, and this, this, I will pay you hundreds of thousand dollars for it. I've actually been in conversations like that. Uh, on the consumer side, it's uh, I think a lot more difficult. So you know, uh, I think. I, I don't think it's actually a very useful phrase, personally. Uh, I think it's, as an entrepreneur, you, you're incumbent, it's incumbent upon you to understand the, your customer better than they understand themselves, if that makes sense. Sometimes they're right, and sometimes they're wrong, and you have to, you have to really understand what the, what the value proposition you're delivering, how you're delivering it, and, um, and you know, really understand the, the customer. Could it also be about asking the right questions? Sure, sure. Oh, absolutely. absolutely. But then there's many, there's stories, I think I told them the, yesterday, there's, there's stories about how, how uh, companies have been really excited about doing customer-centric feedback and, and they didn't burn because they didn't really have a deep understanding of their, their customers. And, um, and sometimes, um, um, I, the thing about this way, the Clayton Christensen, I don't know if you guys know who that is, he's a Harvard professor. Uh, he has this really great phrase where he talks about um, uh, how to think about your product. The way you should think about your product is, that, is the job that your customer hires it for. So, this is, so the example here is gives, like if you have a, if a customer buys a drill bit, a drill bit is where you put inside a drill so you can drill holes in it. They don't really want to buy a drill bit, they want to buy a hole. Mm -hmm. Make sense? Mm -hmm. It's a very powerful analogy in terms of thinking about what, what is it really that you're selling. Yeah, sometimes they tell you they want to buy the drill. Right, exactly, exactly. They don't actually it's struggle. It's very hard to do. Exactly, and so, and so, for example, in, in, you know, I think about this a lot, uh, just every day. Just, just I like thinking about stuff like this. But you know, for example, you go to the United States and the coffee shop, you know, Starbucks. You guys have it here, I suppose. And coffee, Starbucks, nominally, yeah, it sells coffee, but it doesn't really sell you coffee. It sells you what they call in the United States the third place. It's not your home. It's not your office. You can hang out. You can get on Wi-Fi. You can have some coffee, relax. That they're selling you the experience. Yeah, they're selling you coffee, but that's not really. That's not why they get five dollars for coffee, right? Thank you. I think uh, you should deal with the uh, with the product design when you are selling in global market. For instance, in Brazil, Spain, Portugal, the United States, about the customer feedback. How should uh, the company uh, retain different markets and different customers? You ask me. I don't know. <laughs> uh, it's a, it's a, I, I don't know. It's a, that's a different I think question. You're probably the most likely to have an answer. Yeah. Uh, given yeah. <laughs> one, <laughs> one size fits all. <laughs> <laughs> you can have any color as long as it's black. <laughs> <laughs> no, at, uh, at Apple, I was a speechwriter. And, and we would an, have an annual sales meeting. And the chief executive would present. And one year, we had a theme in the chief executive's speech where he said, Apple needs to be a company with two hearts. One heart in Cupertino, in the headquarters, in the design base, but a heart <coughs> where Apple lives everywhere else in the world. And that gave infinite, because Apple, Apple products have to be infinitely localizable and customizable to international markets. But to call this out and say two hearts brings a dimension of humanity to the whole discussion about product localization and a global business 
enterprise? It's a kind of a, maybe a lofty answer to your question, but um, I think it's served Apple well. Yes. And the Salesforce did very well. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I like your motto of uh, demo or die. How do you balance that to the that the competitor will have your, your idea? Yeah, so at least my experience has been that that's an inflated risk in your mind. Like, dramatically inflated risk in your mind. And, and here's the reason. Like, going back to the, it's not really hard to build. Most of the companies don't fail because they can't build what they set out to build. They fail because nobody wants it, right? you're ultimately probably going to be judged on your ability to execute on whatever you set out to do. And so, you know, if somebody getting, if, if somebody getting your idea, you know, a month after you do, as you start to make progress, can now execute you, you know, that's not really that, uh, that's not really that good. Yeah, you're not really onto something there, and you probably need to think about harder about getting better at executing, getting better at moving quickly, getting better at, at learning from the demos that you do. So um, I think you went over this yesterday, I'm sure, in your workshop, but the, the sort of catchphrase in Lean Startups now is, right, build, test, learn. You need to get, you need to get better how quickly you can move through those iterations. Um, I, I just, and the, the one that actually is sort of related to that is people always say, like, well, what if, um, you know, what if Google sees what you're doing? You know, maybe they'll do it. Like, I don't think you realize how much crap there is going on in big companies, right? Big companies are like obsessed with like crap, like just doing tons and tons of things. And so, like, you're you're really that's really not that risky. Rarely do you see. I mean, it happens. Like, I can think of one startup in Pittsburgh who certainly went out and started doing something, and a big company went and did it and sort of blew them away. But like, that's rarely the reason. Like, I see a company fail. And in that case, I don't think it's because they saw the startup doing it, it's just because they had the same idea and went to do it. So I, I just I think that's a, a dramatically inflated risk of us on to Also, to just to dovetail on that, uh, I would just assume that you can have, as soon as you do something well, you can have competitors that are gonna clone your stuff. It's just like a matter of like it's just gonna happen. And then like Raven was saying, the first mover advantage probably doesn't exist anyway. Right? Look at Facebook, it certainly wasn't the first social network. But Google certainly right was certainly wasn't the first a search engine, so I think it's uh, it's almost like a vanity thing. And I, by the way, I, I used to think that the same way, like, oh, I can't show this to anyone. It's such a beautiful little idea. <laughs> <laughs> I can keep it to myself till it's ready for you. <laughs> I'm actually really curious, Raymond, on, on this, having watched the Twitter thing at the seat that you got to do it, right? So when after Twitter sort of started to get popular, right, after we went from, boy, this is a toy that nobody will use, to boy, this is a toy that works at events, to, man, this is actually really powerful, right? Other people came out and did things that were similar, right? And some of the things that were similar actually ended up getting funded by the same people and sort of moving into slightly different spaces that weren't quite as similar as they seemed, like Tumblr. And others kind of went away for a variety of reasons. But like, how did those guys think about the, you know, man, what if somebody has the same, the same idea, or what, like when does these things emerge? Uh, so, Competition is good. I don't probably need to say that at a business school, in a university, or a, a commercial setting. Competition is healthy. And, and at Twitter, it was uh, bring it on. Yeah. And it's an open source system. You know, it's, it's old, the ultimate in transparency. So let's see what the world is doing, if it's going to make, it potentially makes our product better. Okay. Um, I think a more, uh, a more poignant example would be the early days of the Macintosh at Apple, when Apple came out with the Mac, and it was, no, I'm sorry, I apologize, it was the Apple II. And uh, IBM had yet to release the personal system PS1. When IBM released the personal system one, so Apple was the only game in town. And they ran an ad, and all it said in the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, the major metropolitan dailies, welcome IBM, seriously. <laughs> because it set up a comparison. And people would say, oh, the Apple II is kind of cool. It's got a mouse, it's got an interface, right? So it's good. Bring it on, you know? And a, you know, a, a good, vigorous discussion about feeds and speeds and products and specs. I think it's healthy. Yeah. Ship early, ship often, get it out there. Don't be afraid. <laughs> Two questions right here in the front row. 
Can I go first? The uh, question just for Sean. You were talking about uh, you would have liked to launch with more than 20 people. Um, just a very simple question. Imagine you have uh, still a lot of bugs. What was the size of the invitation only stage that you would have liked to done? 100 guys, 500, 1,000, 10 k I, I think that I would have liked to, like, within a month of having come up with the idea, had something that significantly more than 20, probably as many as I could drive, like 100 or so, uh -huh. were using, right? And I, and I think over time we got to the point, and I, I didn't maybe say set this up so well, but we got to the point where we were, we were testing ideas before we even had product, right? <coughs> so I probably would have liked to, like a week after having the idea for FeedHub, have three or four landing pages set up with different, different value propositions, right? So um, one of those might be avoid information overload, stop marking all your feeds as read. Another might be discover interesting sources that you're not reading today and see like which one of those two marketing messages is getting a higher response rate so that um, we would emphasize building those kinds of features, right? So uh, that's how I would have liked to have done it. Um, I would have probably learned a lot and maybe we would never even, FIFA may have never launched had I known everything I knew about the RSS market today. Um, but that was not what we did and, and sort of live and learn. Thanks. Well, I, I see a bit of a, of, a, of a paradox here. On one hand, if you want to bring up like disruptive innovation, we have to um, sort of uh, alienate the, the, the customers, not ask them directly what they need, because it's like probably are going to pollute the, 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 the development uh, process. On the other hand, we, we are also defending the idea that we have to go out there and, and develop, co-develop the, the, the product with the customer. Isn't there something to be said on the customer selection process so that we actually come up with a, with a, with a product that goes along um, uh, 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 some innovation uh, lines that, uh, that, um, that uh, can, can, um, can bring up something really new? Ajal, can I take a stab at this one? Yeah, help yourself. <laughs> <laughs> so actually, it's a, it's a, it's a, there's a few things that are packed in there, but actually, I don't. So really quick, just going back to customer development or lean startup doesn't mean you actually go out and ask them what they want necessarily. Like you don't go, what do you want, and I'll build it. That's just feature monitoring. If you do that, you can get a thousand different answers. You don't actually it doesn't show you have an understanding, right? Uh, but at the same time, you can run tests on people. They, they, don't, even, they don't even know that they, they're being uh, tested. Like for example, like Sean said, the landing page campaign, right? Now, how that how that feeds into disruptive innovation, a la Clay Christensen or sustained innovation, up to, up to the debate. But uh, I, I do want you guys like sometimes you can't ask people say what do you want and they go this this and this right. Sometimes you can't. I, I don't. It's. Uh, it's, I don't know if I necessarily see the paradox, I guess, is, is what I'm saying. So, you got to take a step back for a second. And, and it relates to one of the questions here about customers always king. I think there is a population of businesses, but specifically professional services businesses, where uh, the, the service provider needs to listen acutely to what the customer needs. Right? and needs to develop solutions that meet those needs. But we're talking about entrepreneurship, about developing categorically new classes of activities right? that open up horizons that had never been opened before. This is like Vasco da Gama style innovation. right? This is bold, audacious thinking. And they're categorically different exercises customer wasn't going to tell Steve Jobs that they wanted mm -hmm. a little box about the size of a chocolate bar that would access the internet, give them weather, and send mail, and everything else. <laughs> that wasn't going to happen. So it's a different, two different populations of, of businesses. Is that, is that a helpful answer? Is your well, paradox the, been resolved? There's a second part, <laughs> which is I didn't see any, any kind of, um, let's say, better stage iPhone coming, coming to the market just to prove in, in, in small iterations. I, that I disagree, I'll tell you this. That's why, because you didn't have the first version of the iPhone. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the first version of the iPhone couldn't do copy and paste. There was Newton. Yeah. Yeah. There was Newton. The first yeah, Newton. Newton. iPhone was Newton. 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 Exactly. Yeah. 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 Which was a great speech. Session here? <laughs> Are you the next session here? Yeah. Okay, so about Atlas. Um, 
right. Can you talk a minute about Apple? Can I put? This? Yes. Yeah. Come on. Come down for a minute. Come on down. Everyone, welcome so, Tony Fernandez. Tony's gonna just come for a minute. Apple, I think we have some missed impressions. <laughs> Sorry to pull you on, but since you talked about this last night, you seemed willing, so. So, what was the heart of the question? Well, so the, I think the heart of the question is, like, he was saying, you know, how much, te like, Apple, you didn't see a beta version of the iPhone, and you were talking about, like, the user testing that goes on inside Apple that people may not always yeah, exactly. appreciate, right? So. Yeah, I, I think, you know, from, um, from a product uh, development standpoint, uh, there's a lot of uh, user-centered techniques that reduce a lot of risk in the process by, uh, you know, basically having a lot of internal uh, prototypes and ideas that get tested with people and get refined very quickly. So, a lot of the companies that we work with, for example, by the time you see a product that comes to market, we will have started with an idea, and by the time you see it, it will have been, say, the third or fourth redesign that happened invisibly inside, totally based on customer feedback, before you see the product. So it looks from the outside like there isn't that kind of experimentation, that there isn't a lot of beta, but in fact there is. It just happens to be inside. Apple in particular, very insular, very protective of uh, uh, that kind of thing. Um, and just another example that comes to mind, we uh, work with HP on their uh, Media Smart TV, which was the first high definition network television. And uh, we actually placed them in people's homes in the Bay Area before anybody even knew what a network television was. And, you know, people signed non disclosure agreements. And so these things were actually being used out in the real world. Um, so that's how that happened in my mind. Yeah. So, well, let's, the be oh, sorry, sorry, let's be very clear. So you are telling us that uh, Apple products didn't come fully formed from Steve Jobs' brain no. into the market. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay, no, so and, and Tony was at Apple, right? So this is a this yeah. is a like this is an Apple Thanks. person. <laughs> well, there's a lot of uh, you know, there's a big pachinko machine if you know what that is in between there. But uh, but I, what I will say about Steve Jobs, uh, I think in my mind, I mean, I was. Uh, like him, I was there between jobs. Uh, the, the influence uh, was there. Was that I, I think part of the the what made the difference in the between jobs phase versus the last jobs phase is that sometimes it takes it takes a bastard with you know to push a level of quality that sometimes is hard to achieve. And I think that's one of the big things that he was able to do is just demand a certain level of quality. That and nothing else was going to be acceptable. You know, it's not a ma it's not really a genius thing. It's just a setting a, a bar that's high that the organization is expected to achieve. So you're calling Steve Jobs a bastard? <laughs> <laughs> I knew I shouldn't have come down. <laughs> Actually, a lot of people I know I didn't, I've never met the man, but I know a lot of people who have, and that's. They say that's a pretty appropriate yeah. answer. That would actually be a kind word, I yeah. think, for it. Absolutely. <laughs> so it's sort of an extension of that question. I mean, when you talk about these, like what a company that actually said, like, for example, you said Starbucks sells a third room, Coke has sells nostalgia. Um, like, those sorts of things, like, to what extent are they developed by the company and to what extent are they developed by their customers? Yeah, because like as and, and as as a startup, like how do you create that sort of message? Because I think that's something that builds, right? To me, it sounds like it. Why am I wrong? I feel like it does build. I feel like you know, you end up getting smart. Part of the lesson is you end up getting smarter from your community, right? Like your community um, helps you fill the fill the narratives. Narratives in. Like, I would imagine things like the Iran stuff helped the narrative at Twitter get much stronger, mm -hmm. right? Because it just made it real for, for them, right? And they, they probably didn't, you know, or in the first week of thinking of the Twitter idea, think, man, this could change how. Not at all. Right, but it, it makes the narrative, right? So I think you work hard, you, you, you do the right things, you let, and, and those narratives do develop over time, I think. Let me see if I can give you like a tactical example. 
true story. A friend of mine uh, was uh, working in a startup, and they were doing online uh, bookkeeping. Online, that's online. They were doing online accounting, online accounting, which is different than bookkeeping. Yeah. And the survey there, the users, they had quite a few users who were successful, and people kept saying like, oh yeah, it's a great, uh, this is a great bookkeeping tool. And they're, the, internally they're like, no, we're a fucking accounting tool. And our <laughs> users don't get it. And then it's like a struggle, and they're like, you know what, let's try using bookkeeping, because people are, are referring to us as, as a bookkeeping tool, even though like they're wrong. But let's use that in our messaging, and guess what happened? Their conversions and their revenue went up. And so this idea of what are you really providing Right? Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it actually made like a material difference in terms of user acquisition. It was like a big deal. It was an internal struggle they had. Like, we're an accounting tool, but our users think we're bookkeeping. Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's not easy. It's not easy. But what you're ultimately talking about is the ability for leadership to articulate a vision. Everyone on the planet aspires to certain things. They want to explore the stars. Or they want to do something as mundane as ride their skateboard, right? When you're riding your skateboard down the road and you come to a curb, you have to dismount, get off the skateboard, walk up the curb, and then continue on your way. What people want is a curb cut, right? They want a slope so they don't have to get off their skateboard. It helps people get where they are, to where they want to be. This was the philosophy, basic, simple, beautiful, <coughs> elegant vision. Technology helps bridge the gap between where people are today, we all have limitations, to where we want to be and what we want to do. And that is the centerpiece of Apple, I believe, to this day. And, and it's also the centerpiece of fashion. It's the centerpiece of a great product or service, an automobile. It's a great beverage, it transports you. And that's not easy to do. And it is driven by the company, but it's reinforced by the community. And, and that's, what, that's what ultimately Twitter's success can be attributed to that kind of community building. And, and one, one little anecdote that, uh, to, along that theme is that quite often, it has a lot to do with the language that you use with your customers. For example, uh, you guys know what a TiVo is? The DVR, right? If they had sold that as a Linux, a network Linux box for your living room, <laughs> it was not going to go anywhere. But they sold it as basically a VCR that you didn't have to put tapes into, right? And it's just language, and it's marketing positioning. It's all so understanding where your customers are at, and then catering the language of how you position, how you describe what your product is all about can make an enormous difference. And I think for entrepreneurs, especially those that are have their hands really dirty in creating the product, sometimes it's hard to get away from that because you're so familiar with the innards of what's in there that you want to describe it based on your experience of what you had to build. And it's critical for you to step back and put yourself in your customer's shoes about how they're going to see what, you, uh, what you're doing, not what you built. Uh, we had a question. Okay. Uh, hi. Um, I have a sense, I don't, know, I don't know if it's true or not, but I have a perception that some small startups um, that somehow uh, have a disruptive innovation went sort of all in. You know, it's like they didn't care uh, if their product was being accepted or not, so they, they really took a chance. For instance, uh, we were talking about T-Hub just a while. It seemed sort of like you were playing poker and you put all the chips in it, or something like that. Uh, so what, I, what, I was, what I'm thinking is, should disruptive innovation that comes from smaller startups be um, a contrived process and uh, a thought out process, or should it be like, you know, like that poker final where you put all the chips in and say, well, I don't care, this can either work or can either not work, and uh, we'll see what happens uh, later if I throw myself in it. I mean, so I feel like being an entrepreneur requires you to go all in with your time, which is the most valuable yeah. thing you have, right? So before I say anything else, like I think, yeah, it's, you, to be an entrepreneur, you, you, you do, you, you sort of throw all of yourself into it. But I think that um, you, could, you can play poker where you count cards, and you can play poker when you don't count cards, and I think um, what we did with T-Hub is we didn't 
we didn't count any cards, we didn't do much, we just sort of, I mean, and I don't mean to, I had, to this day, I would say the engineering team I had that put VHub together was the strongest engineering team I've ever worked with. They were, they were brilliant guys, um, but, but like we didn't do anything to help them engineer the right product at all, right? And so I think that a lot of these, these recipes are ways to help you get better at playing that game. It's still risky, it still requires all of you and, and lots of risk, but you just need to get, you need, there are things that can make it uh, a little safer, risky thing. There's a book by Mike Malone, who started the Silicon Valley Comes to Oxford program, called Betting It All. And it profiles eight entrepreneurs who put everything down, everything on the line to build their business. It's all, it's, it's go for it. And I, I think if you hedge, you might win, but, uh, but, but uh, you've got to be built pretty bold, and pretty audacious. Well, I think that's a great comment and a great uh, book for us to finish with. We're a little bit over time already.